Hey, who drawn? Finance. 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 I'm doing well. Met at Ross Ludwig's, uh, oh, that's very gracious yes. of you to remember. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. That's very great. Yes. Good afternoon. Let's get started. Before I announce our next week's speaker and introduce our speaker today, let me first mention that there is an attendance sheet passing around. So for the students who are registered for this class, please make sure that you sign in the sheet. We do these random calls twice or thrice over a semester, and today is one of those random calls. All right. Uh, our speaker next week will be Richie Ahuja, who is the Re Regional Director for Asia at the Environmental Defense Fund, and he'll speak to us on energy and development in Asia. They've been doing a lot of work for several years, and uh, they have collected a lot of l very large-scale primary data in India along various aspects of uh, energy, especially on low-income uh, energy usage, and so it should be a very interesting talk for us to uh, get their first-hand insights. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kelly Klima, who is a research scientist at the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. She has over 10 years of research experience on adaptation, risk communication, hazard mitigation, climate, extreme weather, um, and her research work supports community resilience uh, across the world, and a lot of her work has been used in many parts of New Jersey and is increasingly finding uh, a lot of use. As you can imagine, Resiliency is, is really a very important thing and has gotten a lot of policy attention also, so her work is starting to make an even bigger imp impact. She got her doctorate degree also from the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon, where she used physics, a combination of physics, economics, and social sciences to do a decision analytic uh, assessment of different methods for uh, reducing hurricane damages, uh, some very interesting interdisciplinary work uh, that uh, Kelly has done. Uh, besides publishing widely in many journals, uh, she is an active member of nine professional societies and serves on the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association Board of Directors and the American Geophysical Union Executive Council. It's a pleasure to introduce Kelly to you, please. Thanks very much, guys. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I was told it'd be a little bit warmer, but you know I'll still take it. It's what single digits in Pittsburgh right now. So what can you do? But uh, today I'm going to chat with you a bit about 10 strategies to systematically exploit all options to cope with anthropogenic climate change. And we're going to do two pieces with this. We're going to talk about this overarching framework that I developed with some of my students, as well as then take what we call a sample study or a deep dive into one of the particular pieces to sort of flesh out for you, um, you know, how we would go about then putting all these things together. So with the first piece, uh, let's just jump right in on this framework. So. I'm told that most of you guys are students, but I do have some faculty and perhaps some industry folks in the crowd. So a lot of this uh, may be a little bit of review for some of you, but please bear with me so, until we get through some of these pieces. Classically, risk is a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. A hazard, um, here depicted by a green circle, um, with some sort of uncertainty related to it, and that's the little Gaussian cartoon figure below that. And a hazard is something like a hurricane or a flood or a fire. Second is the exposure also has a Gaussian distribution on it to indicate uncertainty. And what this means is what is all the stuff that's in the way of the hurricane, the flood, or the fire? For instance, the people in the community, the businesses, the infrastructure, all these types of things. And then third is the vulnerability. 
again with our little Gaussian to indicate uncertainty there. And the vulnerability is for these people or houses or businesses or infrastructure in the way, how much when they are hit by the actual hurricane will they be affected? And when you combine all these things together, you end up with that nice little piece in the middle of risk and also an uncertain piece on that as well. Um, however, in addition to these vulnerabilities from that last slide, what we're seeing with a lot of different choices in life, regardless of why you're forced to make them, that there may also be opportunities associated with things. So let's take a look at this in a slightly different way. Here we have this box of hazards at the top, our hurricanes and sunny days, <laughs> really sunny days, and flooding. And then different things are exposed, and these are the sectors at risk. And I just put a few images on here to help uh, illuminate some of those, and they're like transportation, and maybe the health uh, infrastructure, the energy infrastructure. And then, of course, there are some opportunities associated with these risks of, let's say, for instance, that you had a hurricane coming, and you were in the energy sector, and you had a choice to perhaps put things in a different area to preposition or to sell batteries to people in, in uh, advance of the hurricane. All of these are possible benefits one can get out of those sorts of risks. And they can do things both making you happier as well as getting you a little bit more money. And of course, what we normally think of is that other side, that other piece of the vulnerabilities, which is the different damages one might see, usually economic, um, sometimes also put in quality of life uh, with the smiley faces or whatnot. But here I just put the dollar signs to indicate those. So the difficulty with this starts to arise when you look at what are called negative and positive feedbacks. So a negative feedback isn't necessarily bad, and a positive feedback isn't necessarily a good thing. I'm not assigning a, a quality to this of uh, which is um, you know, better for people. What it instead means is how it exacerbates the problem or dampens the problem. So for instance, something that might be exacerbation is something that when a hazard hits a sector, the sector does in response that makes it even more vulnerable or more exposed to the hazard. Similarly, you can have something with a deterioration pieces on here of when you do certain actions to take advantage of either opportunity or vulnerability uh, of these risks, then these feed back into the sectors and make them even more vulnerable, even more opportunities occur. Negative feedbacks are some of our more classical things that we're thinking of when we are hazard mitigation or climate adaptation professionals. Things like mitigation, where the sectors will uh, try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to lessen the cl climate change problem and lessen the hazards in the first place. Or something called adaptation, and it, we already get a little bit tricky because hazard mitigation professionals, uh, their version of hazard mitigation is mostly adaptation, but a little bit of the mitigation here. But in the event, the adaptation is taking something like, all right, well, we know this is going to happen, so let's adapt for it and build a seawall or what have you and protect the sectors at risk, and then that'll lessen the risks in the future, right? So we've got some positive and negative pieces. And clearly, this is starting to get pretty complicated already just when we're thinking about how do we do a very simple decision analysis for these things. Here's a subset. I just randomly picked uh, heat waves and warm spells, um, largely because I thought you guys might be warm compared to Pittsburgh, but that didn't really appear to happen. Um, but in any case, uh, with something that is a climate-related symptom, uh, heat waves in the future, warmer spells, these will have effects these symptoms of hazards, increasing heat waves, maybe either frequency or intensity, will have implications for then the resulting, say, sectors of agriculture, forestry, and ecosystems where you might have different planting seasons, or you might have more increase of wildfire and therefore be more at risk to having your lumber burned down. Some of the pieces with the water resources for instance, um, a really a big thing, I think, for a lot of folks in the energy community, because there's a very clear connection between water and energy. 
and when you have uh, different types of power plants and it's a warmer temperature out, you have two problems of the water that's getting withdrawn in order to cool for the power plant is at a higher temperature and so it's not as effective in cooling uh, at your cooling towers. And secondly, you have some pieces with humidity that come into that where the um, temperature and the precipitation work together to increase humidity and then there's also some effects. You can have effects on just for the heat waves and the warm spells of human health and that's pretty clear through heat related illnesses such as uh, um, when you have heat stroke. It also increases things like your um, risk at uh, risk for death or morbidity due to say asthma or due to diabetes or due to cardiovascular illnesses, all these sorts of things, when it's a little bit hotter out, your body is just not quite able to deal with as well. And then, of course, uh, I do a lot of work in the built environment, so there's a lot of this idea of for the sectors of the different industries, for the different community sectors, um, how will that affect quality of life or air conditioning use or any of these things. And that gets into another piece on the far right-hand side with your electric power because as the heat waves rise, you also have this piece of, especially here in Texas, people putting on their ACs more, so you have a higher peak load demand during the warm days of your summer. So I showed all that to the city of Pittsburgh's, not mayor, but like second in command sustainability officer, and I put him to sleep pretty quickly. Thankfully, I haven't put too many of you to sleep, but um, he definitely wasn't paying attention anymore. So given that, and, I, and you know, it's, it's really hard because you're like, yeah, I do decision analysis. This is really great. So you can do hazard and vulnerability, and they're like, what? I don't care. So one of my students and I sat down and said, well, how can we simplify this, smarten this discussion in a way to discuss decision analysis and risk such that my mayor will quickly understand and then be able to use this analysis. Or even um, help us as researchers have some sort of framework to remember all the different pieces that can go into reducing your risk and account for all of them or whatever subset that you care about uh, when you're doing your analyses. So we wanted something that applied to many different types of hazards and sectors. You know, climate change is one particular type, but there are a lot of other things that one could care about in the world. And we wanted one that defined mitigation and adaptation a little bit more clearly because there is a very large disconnect between the hazard mitigation professionals and the climate adaptation professionals because they just can't seem to get on the same page with what the words are. And then they sit arguing with each other about the definitions as opposed to actually doing anything. And uh, definitions are important. Uh, but not quite, you know, where I want different folks to be spending their time. And then um, doing something that lastly does that uh, systematic analysis or systematic assessment of different options. So helping to facilitate that in some way so that we can include all the pieces we need to include. Um, some might have heard of life cycle assessments. This was sort of a similar sort of take of know where are all the things going in the system and out of the system and what should we account for where. So luckily, not so much in hazard mitigation and climate adaptation, but in the medical field, we already had something that did this. Back in the 1970s, this guy named Hadden, or perhaps Hayden, people like to argue with me on that as well. Um, this guy addressed risk reduction in the health community, and he said there were 10 different strategies. And I know the font here is a little bit hard to read, and I apologize for that, but I'll just go through these a little bit, uh, a little quickly. Um, it starts off with the idea of there's some sort of hazardous energy. And he had applied this primarily to radiation from x-rays, uh, but there's a whole bunch of different hazardous energies you could apply it to, right? But the first thing he said was laying out the systematic assessment is, well, you could just prevent the generation of the radiation, the hazardous energy, to begin with. Or you could reduce the amount of it somehow. Like, maybe it's still being produced, but you can, like, you know, get rid of it somehow. Not sure how you quite do that for radiation, but whatever. He's trying to be inclusive. You could prevent the release into whatever area you're in. Or you could modify the spatial impact of the hazardous energy and rate of spatial distribution. 
So all of these things are four different ways, four different takes on how you could reduce the hazard. So yes, there's an x-ray machine with radiation. Part one broken into uh, four different subsections is let's reduce the hazard. Then second, he comes down and starts to think about reducing exposure. How do I get the endangered object, usually the person, um, out of the way from the hazard, either in time or in space? Right? You could you know, move them to a different room or you know, blink the radiation at a time when they're not there, what have you. And so that's all exposure related. And then it walks into this third part of reducing the vulnerability. So yes, we have the radiation. Yes, we have the person in the way. What if we you know, modify the contact of the endangered object somehow? Maybe like put some lead walls in between them and the other you know, the radiation. Or if we strengthen the structure of the endangered object. Um, didn't work so well for radiation and x-rays, but there's other things you could like, you know, shoot yourself with um, a vaccination or something like that that'll, you know, prevent the spread of the disease. So reducing vulnerability, making the object that's at risk less vulnerable. And then last was, you know, he was a realist. There's always going to be some times when radiation gets through and hits your person and hurts them. So you want to in these instances, limit the damage by quick detection and evaluation. So figure out it's happening quickly, and then figure out how to recover and reconstruct. Hard to reconstruct a person, but the reconstruction lends itself very well to some of the hazard mitigation and climate adaptation. And what my student and I found when we went through this, so we have all these 10 strategies, hazard, exposure, vulnerability, coping damages, and these align very clearly with what we're seeing for some of the different options that decision makers want to do policy-wise to reduce damages from climate change. And they run into the mitigation type things of reducing greenhouse gas emissions through to adaptation, you know, strengthening the structure, reducing the exposure, and things that are more of your emergency management. You know, man, the hurricanes are just going to get bigger. Let's just get some more ambulances pre-positioned, ready to go, and, you know, when the seas flood and Miami's gone, then you know, we'll figure out what to do with better plans. Right? So we went ahead and applied this to climate change. And again, remember we were uh, speaking to the city of Pittsburgh, the mayor's office. Um, they like acronyms and things that go nicely together. So we started with the source. Maybe you could do something to reduce the source. And these are the first four strategies and Haddon's uh, strategies. And these primarily, in our case for climate change, would focus on greenhouse gases. How do you reduce the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change adaptation? Then we have a symptom. You might be seeing a, a, you know, a trend already. Uh, but these are the strategies five through six. And these are things like, for the temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, these hazards that are coming out, you know, what do we do specifically to address those? And we have sectors. Say we have greenhouse gas emissions that are increasing the temperature and causing heat waves, and this is affecting our water resources and our consumption and withdrawal rates. Well, what we might do in some of those instances for strategies seven through eight is concentrate specifically on the water sector and see what we would do at our local water utility plant to alter the way that they're cleansing their water or doing the water withdrawals, what have you. And the last thing was, well, we're just going to have some suffering with these damages, and we're just going to have to deal with that. So this framework with uh, the four S's um, resonated pretty well with my mayor. He, he liked that. Um, other folks have liked it or not. It is a little bit cheesy sometimes, I understand. But it is something that does help sort of remember some of the different ways that one can reduce the risk from your whatever you're risk to, at risk to. And you can do this with the different sources. You can go right to the problem and tackle the greenhouse gas emissions. You can combat certain types of things like sea level rise. Maybe you're going to you know, put in a certain type of barrier or what have you. Sectors and suffering. So I wanted to share with you two case studies that we had done. One was sort of a broader piece, 
And the second was that deep dive that I mentioned into one particular topic, sort of illuminating what one would do when you focus in on an area. So the first thing that we did was we took all of the climate change plans for Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, three city governments I have worked with when I was consulting, and applied this framework to that. And so we had the 10 different strategies on the left-hand side, and D.C., Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, and zooming in just on D.C. for those top four, so you might actually be able to read some things. Uh, this was just looking at the different ways that Pittsburgh had in the past chosen to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There were some climate-specific plans, and you can see the dates are running really early on, say 2006 on the left hand, most left-hand side, through to 2012. And then some general planning pieces that in this case didn't really affect greenhouse gas emissions directly, but did affect some of the uh, symptoms or sectors or suffering later on. And what we saw just for these three cities was that over time, as climate change specifically became more of an issue in all three areas, maybe because you know, there was more understanding of it or uh, maybe it was just trendy or you know, another way to get federal dollars, I don't really want to say. But over time, um, we ended up with 2006 and then 2012, and to some extent with the others, a little bit more of the different pieces were plugged into. So basically, as time went on, cities tried to tackle the problem in a couple different ways and kept adding things on. And when we showed this then to the mayor's office again, sorry, I'm relying on them a little heavily today, hopefully they're not, you know, turning over and yelling at me in Pittsburgh right now for saying these things. But uh, basically, when you show this to them, they're like, oh, yes, of course. We could also be doing something in this area. And hey, you know what? It would also help our city of planning office or something like that. And so this really did sort of help them see what they were missing and tie it directly quickly to, oh, this will help sectors, or this will help the symptoms, or this will just help in general with emergency management and the suffering. So then the second piece was looking at sample strategies to reduce heat-related morbidity and illness in India. So good times with this. So what I had done here was just take the 10 strategies. Um, the source is listed up on here because this is the source section, the first four. And the source for heat-related morbidity and illness in India uh, for this instance was man-made climate change. And so there are a lot of other reasons why it's really hot in India, and we'll get to them when we get down to the other strategies. But for the moment, I'm just looking at just the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So you can do a bunch of different things. And what we see are these are the big picture things that affect all sorts of different man-made climate change. And that makes sense because these first four strategies are affecting the source. So these are things like using alternative or renewable energies, decarbonization, somehow magically sequestering carbon dioxide or geoengineering or all of these things to you know, help the environment. And those are your greenhouse gas emission pieces. Then as you get a little bit farther, you start to get in these symptoms. And when you're focusing on the symptoms and the sectors, you know, man-made climate change to extreme heat events, well, you know, extreme heat events might not happen because of climate change, right? They can happen normally. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons they could happen. So what you're seeing is, yes, these symptoms are a narrowing, a focusing from the man-made climate change to the extreme heat events. But the types of options that are um, listed in here also affect all extreme heat events and so might have... Uh, you know, might come into play in other frameworks with other sources. So this starts to get into the idea of co-benefits, that when you're doing something to reduce man-made climate change, these first four, you're probably just going to be doing it just to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, these, these four. Um, and you might get some, like, costs and, you know, things out of that and make some money. But really, when you start to move down to the symptoms and then even farther down in the sectors on the human health, well, man, if you install a water park for the human health, yes, 
you are addressing the problem of man-made climate change, which causes extreme heat events, which is hurting human health. Yes. But you know, these water parks are also helping out in any extreme event. They're also helping out in general for folks that, you know, want to have a water park. It does things like improve property value and some of those other pieces. So with this idea of co-benefits, we're trying to figure out a good way to pull this into the framework and not make it even crazier. But right now, basically what happens is I just say, hey, we have co-benefits. There's other reasons to do this. Isn't that great? Um, and then the last one with the suffering was this idea of increased deaths, injuries, infectious diseases, and you have those things like emergency management. And those tend to, again, sort of be when you're looking at human health and their deaths and illnesses with people, you know, very unfortunate circumstances. But fortunately, at least, we have some infrastructure already in place to deal with that through the concepts of ambulances and other pieces. So I have a couple of different students working on different areas of this. Most of my work does focus on heat events and heat-related illnesses and understanding vulnerability a little bit better in some of those pieces. And there's another couple pieces that I do on trying to improve the reliability or the resiliency of the electric infrastructure. Um, but today, since I'm at the UT Energy Symposium, I thought I would share a bit about what I and one of my colleagues, Jay Aft, who I'm told has spoken here before, are doing on alternative and renewable energies um, in India. And one thing to know with this is it's all the way up at the top, right? So technically, yes, anything that gets done up here at the top will affect extreme heat events and human health and death and injury and suffering in India. But it is one of those you know, higher level pieces. So in the sense of affects a large range of things over a large variety of greenhouse gases. So you guys all know this. There's a ton of different renewable energies. You have solar, you have wind, you have biomass, although people like to argue with me on that one. So I don't know what you guys want to do. We can argue about that later. Um, this is my PowerPoint drawing of a volcano for geothermal, uh, waves, and hydropower. I didn't draw that, but that's a dam. Um, and for all of these, the, one of the big problems with renewable energy, right, aside from costs and some other things and integration into the grid, is that some are, very, some are variable and require backup generation of some sort or smoothing of some sort in order to be able to use reliably and effectively in the grid. And the two main ones are my uh, sun and wind here, now currently in color. And these are both highly variable uh, sources. The wind blows sometimes, doesn't blow other times. The sun shines sometimes, doesn't shine. There's clouds that get in the way. Life is really tough when you're trying to rely solely on these two pieces. So how can you figure out you know, what is the potential for smoothing? Well, you have a lot of researchers that use the frequency domain to understand wind variability and smoothing. You can use two choices. You have the time domain or the frequency domain. Time domain gives you what the generation or the resource is over a long period of time. You can look at it and you can say, well, if I do this and this and I correlate these two sites, you know, life is crazy pretty quickly. And what we see instead is that in the frequency domain, we can discuss whether there might be theoretical reasons for why these sorts of variability and smoothing uh, that we see occur. Specifically in wind, this has been pretty well studied in wind, and we just had a researcher um, come chat with us at Carnegie Mellon who was talking a little bit more about this. But it's well known in the frequency domain that the fluctuations for those high, frequency, um, uh, high frequencies which are things that are on the order of like seconds or minutes. Uh, the power, the amount of power in those frequencies is very small. Thousands of times smaller than the power that you get out of the one day or the one month type frequencies. And what this means is that you, have, you can have slow fossil fuel plants that can ramp up and down on the order of like a day or a couple hours. And you don't need as many of those quick response batteries to back up some of that variability, right? And it turns out that when you hook a bunch of power plants together, a bunch of wind power plants, using geographic diversity, so you know the wind blows here sometimes, doesn't blow here other times, maybe there's a 
mountain in the way, who knows. Um, when you hook up these things together, then you can reduce those high frequency variations even more. And th further reducing the need for batteries, right? And what we saw um, recently is that there appears to be a theoretical limit to that. What we see when we hook power plants together is a comologue. Thank you. Word's not working today. Um, spectrum. And when uh, you hook a bunch of different ones together, it starts to approach a slightly different spectrum. Um, so the question that we had was, well, this is great because wind has this spectrum, high frequencies, you know, very little power in it, low frequencies, a lot of power. And when you put a bunch of power plants together, you even reduce that a little bit more. So there's even less power in the high frequencies and more in the low frequencies. So this is great. You know, we can hook these things up. But can solar be similarly smoothed? Well, there's a couple different sets of folks that have looked on this, and most have looked purely at irradiance data. This is the idea that, and I'll show a, a slide in a minute, a cartoon sort of showing this piece. But the irradiance data is the solar stuff coming down and hitting the Earth, right? Um, so it doesn't have, it hasn't gone through what the power plant can do to it, or you know what um, angle the solar panels at, or whether the photothermal has a certain type of liquid in it that absorbs heat. And certain, it, it's not caring about any of that. It's just looking solely at what the um, solar resource is. And you know this happens uh, to show that when you correlate to different locations, that as you get farther and farther apart, the correlation decreases. Perhaps not surprising, especially when you're going around a, you know, a latitudinal band, because the sun, when it's shining in California, is not necessarily when it's shining in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Makes some sense, right? And it turns out that it also does that a little bit at the high frequencies. Um, and then uh, there's a bunch of uh, folks who have also looked at changes in clear sky index, which is the idea of it's not just the amount of sun that's shining on the surface, but it's also the clouds that are in the way. And so how do we sort of account for that and then see if we hook a bunch of plants together, you know, whether there could be some smoothing, right? Then you can just go directly and say, well, you know, I don't want to play with satellite data or clear sky indices. Or I'm just going to go straight for the generation data. And there's been many fewer um, different pieces of research that have looked directly at the generation data. Because as you guys know, generation data is hard to get. Plants don't want to release it. There's a whole bunch of issues with like, you know, non-disclosure agreements and stuff. But there's a little bit. And they show that in Germany back, oh, maybe 15 years ago now, uh, that when you hook some plants together, that the ramping speed changes. So that's good. Um, basically, if you have one plant, the, uh, it says the five minute ramps and power may exceed the plus or minus 50%. But if you only have 100 plants hooked together, it never exceeds 5%. So basically, put some plants together, you know, life is better. Or you can just go ahead and correlate real power output for the three different sites, say in Arizona. It's very sunny in Arizona. Um, but they found when they did that with the actual three sites in Arizona, a different um, answer than what Germany found out. Germany was like, oh, yeah, you hook them together, life is good. And, and this piece in Arizona was like, no, actually, it doesn't do any good. And then you have some uh, slightly less strong conclusions that say there might be some possibility for smoothing at hourly resolution. Um, they did a, you know, they did a very good, very concrete piece of work here. Uh, don't mean to make fun of them, but uh, it, it was uh, um, not as strong of a conclusion as some of the others. So anyway, so we can measure the solar data at a couple different locations. We just thought it. We saw some people that wanted to measure it at the surface through the clear sky index of the solar radiation, and some people that want to measure it directly at the generator. So for this study, we had pulled data for both for the purposes of time, because I have about 10 minutes left. I am not going to talk about the um, solar piece with the clear sky index and just the generator piece. So looking at generation for a bunch of different plants, what happens? So we got generation data from 50 power plants in Gujarat, India. The great thing about these power plants is that the generation data is available online in a weird PDF format to download every, roughly every minute, sometimes 45 seconds, sometimes every two minutes. 
what have you. It comes in this weird PDF format, so that's really annoying, so you have to go in and do this text search thing. And I had a whole bunch of computer programmers that I went to a bar with and dared them to help me out with this, and they figured out how to do it in about five minutes, which is great. You know, be friends with computer programmers. That's, that's what I've learned. Um, anyway, so they helped me to download the data from the company website roughly every minute. And of these 50 plants, we found that some of them had very good data reporting and some of them didn't. And what I mean by good data reporting is some of them actually reported generation roughly every minute. Some of them chose to report it like every hour. That's probably not so useful for my purposes to understand the high frequencies. And then additionally, um, some of the plants just uh, uh, after you clean them, there, are, there was a whole bunch of other cleaning mechanisms one would use, like in addition to, you know, did they reach the inverter limit and so they were cut off at certain parts of the day? Um, did they decide to show very large negative values in the middle of the day? And you could make an argument for, sure, they should have some negative values at night because they run their air conditioner to keep the plants cool at night. And so, of course, you know, be a little bit of a draw from the system. But, uh, you know, after you go through a bunch of these, there's about 40 plants left that were good. And I picked out um, just 10 of them that had the most data left. So it was the clearest uh, discussion to sort of show for the rest of this. And red is where everybody else was. And so this is a um, histogram showing what the timestamp intervals were. The length of the timestamp in minutes after the index is on the x-axis and the number of occurrences on the y-axis. So that is 250000. Most of them had timestamps that were within a minute or two. But there were some cases where the data cut out for different reasons for up to 20 minutes or more. And because the timestamps weren't even, and also because they didn't actually report it every minute, they reported sometimes 43 seconds, sometimes 52, and sometimes 63, and you know, I don't know why. It, but for all 50 plants, they took this, they reported this measurement at a slightly different timestamp each time. We had to do some statistical pieces with different types of periodograms. You couldn't do just a pure fast Fourier transformation. You have to do a long periodogram, but you guys aren't here to hear about that. So uh, let's move ahead. When you create a power spectral density function, this is similar to what you get. The frequency is on the x-axis, and the high frequencies uh, over on the right-hand side correspond to very fast times, like a minute or a second. The frequencies on the far left-hand side of the axis are these very long time periods, like days or months. We can see here a peak that is um, at let me actually use the pointer for once. At 24 hours, right here. And that corresponds to this spike, which corresponds to roughly this frequency, right? And the y axis is um, kilowatts per uh, square root of hertz, which is a sampling of what the power means. So basically, as you increase on the y-axis, you have more power. As you decrease, you have less power in this particular frequency. And the solar power, similar to wind, follows a spectrum. Follows a different spectrum. Actually follows f to the roughly uh, minus 1.3. Except for at this tail end here, where it follows a 3D turbulent spectrum. But for the most part, when we're looking at that, f is to the negative 1.3. So I went through and did these spectrum for all the different plants. Here's one plant. I just picked out a random plant. They all sort of looked qualitatively the same. With this spectrum, has roughly the same slope. And it's, you still see that 24-hour and that 12-hour peak, which you would expect after Nyquist aliasing. As you start to sum together plants here in yellow, Yellow are the five closest plants to that initial blue plant. You start to alter the slope of the spectrum. Now, I have uh, adjusted these so they're roughly on the same horizontal piece for these frequencies, so you can clearly see the change in the slope. But there is a little bit. And so this is going from f to the minus 1.3 to like uh, a little bit more than that, maybe f to the minus 1.4 1.5. And when you continue to add plants together, the green here are 10 plants, 10 closest plants added together. There still appears to be a change in the slope, 
and diminishing returns with adding the plants together clearly are starting to happen. Now, what does this mean when these slopes change? Does this mean that there are, as the slopes change, the amount of power that is in the highest frequencies is decreasing compared to the lowest frequencies. And this means that the fluctuations are getting averaged out on a short time period. And so there's less need for batteries or things like that for backup generation. You can concentrate on the power in this other area. And truthfully, that's where most of the power of it is anyway. When you choose to interconnect a bunch of solar plants, very quickly you achieve the majority of the smoothing. This graph can be a little difficult to understand, so I'll try to um, walk folks through it. But on the x-axis is the number of PV sites, photovoltaic sites, that have been linked together, summed together in their generation output. And the y-axis is the fraction of the PSD. So basically, I took these lines here and said, what is the fractional reduction? How much did that slope change? And so that's what that fractional reduction is here. And so what you see is, for different time periods, whether it's 10 minutes, an hour, three hours, or four hours, you get the majority of that smoothing occurring as you hook together maybe two to four different plants. And you see, of course, that this does vary a little bit if you're hooking together five megawatt plants as opposed to 20 megawatt plants. But the main takeaway message is, as you add plants together that are pretty far apart, uh, it's smoothing uh, within two to four plants, roughly. So, Okay, so on our deep dive, which seems to have nothing to do with what I had initially talked about in the beginning of the talk, um, we're seeing that the solar power is very variable. Some smoothing can be attained by interconnecting plants. Clearly got to do a little bit more work on this, and that's what my student's working on now. Now, of course, this is only one really deep dive into the very horizontal framework of the 10 strategies. There are 10 different things here that we could do. And truthfully, there's a whole bunch of sub-characters under each of these uh, as well. Like, I didn't have to focus on solar power. We could have done wind power or something like that. But across this entire framework, this sort of gives a guide to, all right, well, now that I know that solar power can be uh, reduced this way, the next steps could also include figuring out how much carbon reduction that would be. And so then you could pull that into the framework here and, and then compare that to all the other different ways to reduce risks from, in this example that I have, extreme heat events in human health in, in India. Right? Seeing some heads nodding, seeing some heads going like this. All right, we're good. I'm not going to talk to the people of you shaking your heads now. No, that's not, I'm kidding. So basically, these 10 strategies are this framework high-level framework, systems of systems piece, that's what we're thinking here. And it makes possible then, because it's a systems of systems piece, a systematic analysis of options. It's got those four S's, symptom, source, sector, and suffering, that make it really easy for decision makers to understand. And then it's actually applicable to a whole bunch of different types of hazards and sectors, depending on whatever you want to care about. I talked here about climate change, because my work focuses on climate change adaptation to natural hazards, but it could be a whole bunch of different hazards. It does help define some of the words. So when you have these S's, uh, I find that my hazard mitigation and climate adaptation professionals stop arguing about definitions because they're all giggling about the fact that they all begin with S's. And so we've moved past that piece, but there is, of course, a definition component in there. And it also sort of pulls out some of these co-benefits as you bring these together. And some of the next pieces we're hoping to do is some quantitative policy analysis and adaptation metrics. And potentially, because some of the different pieces along the way have different timelines of effectiveness, it could suggest timelines for implementation of some of these pieces as well. But we're nowhere near there yet. Um, what we're doing right now is a couple more of these deep dives. Like I said, I have a couple of folks working on heat vulnerability in different ways to understand how one could uh, like, what is the exposure and the vulnerability? So how do you optimize cooling centers or green infrastructure? Some other pieces to deal with it in that piece. And uh, working with some climate scientists as well to understand certain types of very downscaled pieces for how different components of reducing greenhouse gas emissions affect local temperature, which is a nightmare problem in itself. 
Um, and then, of course, doing more of these policy type pieces because engineering public policy loves doing that sort of work. And I spelled my student's name wrong. Oh, so that's bad. Um, Frauke Haas is not spelled that way. It's F-R-A-U-K-E. Um, but here's a bunch of folks that had helped me out on this work. Everybody else is spelled correctly. That's good. And uh, there's my contact information acknowledgments. And it's 6 p.m. Oh, yeah. Guys, uh, whoever's in the class, remember to sign in and give me the paper when you're done. And we'll take student questions first. Um, I don't know if you looked at this, but did you see any interesting features in the demand power spectrum at high frequencies? In the demand power spectrum? We're looking at the generation data, so we haven't looked at the demand power or the demand spectrum. Okay. Short answer. Thanks. So the measurements that you download from the website, they are the measurements of the entire power generated at the plant or some proxy that can be measured more easily? So it's the Gujarat State Loads Dispatch Center. And what they report, and I've called them and chatted with them a couple times, and they seem to think this is actually true, um, is for each of the 50 plants at an exact second, the generation that those plants have in total for the entire plant. So it's not by wind turbine or anything. It's just by specific plants. The reason that I have to question this is, of course, that I think it's probably not true that all 50 plants spread throughout the entire state of Gujarat, which is like a third of the size of Texas. Um, are actually sampling at exactly the same second, but that's what we're told. So I did pull some uncertainty analysis in on that, which we didn't talk about today. Thanks for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, one thing that I'm a little bit confused about, though, is since this is a supposed to be like a decision-making tool, where does the decision-making happen? It seems like there's a lot of information about how the data or how the information for each of the decisions, but how does a decision maker even like make decisions from that uh, or what do they care see. about? Okay, so on this slide here, this is usually what we're seeing the decision makers like to use. And so what they ask for us as the researchers is data to fill out this and say, go figure out for each of these strategies, I want to know and usually they give me some options that are policy relevant for their city. And we also have some social scientists who are working on deliberative democracy pieces as well as survey and interview and some other psychological pieces to understand what may or may not be acceptable to the population and therefore what um, barriers we already have. But setting all that discussion aside, we get a list of options and they say compare it. And so we as researchers go off and you know, happily, excitedly work on our computer models for the next like month or in some cases much longer, and then provide, hey, okay, so now that we have this, for each of these different things, and they fit in in these places, this is how it will, at the end of the day, affect your risk. And so there's a lot of pieces that one can then also use. Some of my doctorate, I used a FEMA's has us model to do some of the economic losses, and there's some pieces like that that are similar for all of these. Uh, the, uh, India example was a piece trying to understand for the United States some policy decisions that we could make here, but unfortunately we're still, for the last year, been tied up in non-disclosure agreements, so haven't been able to use that. But uh, um, yeah, so basically it's this slide and you figure out everything on the 10 different strategies, you put it on here in a metric that is similar. Most people tend to like economic losses, but you can do deaths and then you can compare them easily that way. Uh, that piece is uh, going to include a lot of decision analysis and some of the different risk functions and your heuristics and other pieces that um, a lot of really great departments and researchers do.
Uh, so I have a, hopefully a quick point of clarification and then also a question. And so the first one is when it comes to the decision analysis framework, are you trying to pick between the strategies or pick what to do for each strategy, what to offer for each strategy? Yeah, that is a fair clarification. Um, what we have been using it for is to compare between strategies and to do that sort of systematic risk analysis of, of that pieces. Um, I'm not sure it would be very good to help you pick out which strategy to use, like, like which um, type of output in a particular strategy to use, if, the, if that addresses your question. Yeah. Well, and now, and now I guess this isn't the original second question I was going to ask. Oh, that's I guess, okay. We'll ask it anyway. Yeah, I guess, well, why not do all of the above with the strategies? Um, you could. Well, I mean, and obviously you wouldn't want to, like, the damages and suffering part you don't necessarily want to do, but the other ones. <laughs> yeah, so I think that most folks agree now that, especially for greenhouse gas reductions, we need a portfolio of all techniques. There's no silver bullet to, to solve this problem, so you really need a bunch of different things. Uh, the pieces that I find most interesting from a systems analysis perspective are how the different things interact. So I might pick solar power, and then I might pick, um, because I'm limited by money and I can only do a, a couple of things, solar power and like, you know, more cooling centers in the city. And so what my interest tends to lie in, how you then, you know, also compare those uh, across each other with the synergistic effects that would occur. Um, that is a very, very wide open field and a lot of adaptation and resilience work. So if you, uh, you know, manage to figure that out, come let me know and, and that'd be great. <laughs> so I guess it, I mean, it sounds like the, the actual policy options that are on the table kind of constrain all the possibilities you're considering and then your tool kind of helps the policymakers pick between what's actually practical. Typically. And as researchers, we can of course choose not to be restricted by the policy options and go off and study whatever our hearts desire. But in a lot of ways, um, we will always have the community um, restrictions on what we can or can't do. So bringing in the community as part of that system and understanding where those uh, restrictions lie can potentially um, help uh, make the problem a little easier to address. So two things on your solar analysis. The first one was you talked about the correlation as you get further away of the correlation between the sun being on the same spots gets less and less. How's that any different than, in my head, I just keep thinking, well, the Earth rotates on its axis. So obviously, as we get, yep. is that's, that all it's saying? That's all that it's saying. And then how of far? Of course, it doesn't help so much at the high frequencies, but that's a different issue. So. And then how far did the solar facilities need to be for you to get that smooth? And you said three to four with a far enough distance. What's that distance? Yeah, so the state of Gujarat, let me see if I, I don't think I remember that slide number. Um, there we go. Um, the state of Gujarat is about a third of the size of Texas. So when you're looking at these different latitudes, you know, there's a 100 kilometers or so in, in each of these latitude bands. Um, you see a different phenomenon happen if you're linking the wind turbines at a particular location or if you have plant A and plant B that might as well be the same plant and you link them. Then if you have plant A and you're separated out a little bit on plant B. This has to do with with call or bleh. this has to do with what is called a characteristic length function. So for those folks in the room that do a lot of fluid mechanics, it has to do with Reynolds numbers and some other pieces of how um, far apart one needs to be in order for the wind or the clouds in this area to be different than the wind or the clouds in another area. So characteristic length scale of what these eddies are. And so for what we're seeing on these pieces, these green dots right there that are close together, um, they're roughly, I think, like 10, 20 kilometers apart, according to Google Maps and the company website. Uh, those are still showing smoothing, even though they're 10 to 20 kilometers apart. This is unusual because the characteristic length scale for wind is a little bit larger. And you see different phenomena when you link two wind plants really closely together. And that's been really well studied. So we're not really sure what is the theoretical reason behind this because solar power is a function of both the sun and the clouds. And uh, it's a little bit unclear. There's some meteorologists at Carnegie Mellon that work on cloud physics and black carbon. And they uh, laughed at me when I asked the question. So I'm not really sure how to answer it much more than that. So this follows up, I think, a little bit on that question because 
I understand, if I understood you correctly, Kelly, you're looking at geographical diversification for some of these things, right? But if you do that for power plants, don't you have to think about the transmission costs? Yes. Well, I guess uh, if you want me to, to elaborate on that more. Don't you need to factor that into the calculation? Um, yes, of course it depends on what your transmission lines are like in the area. In uh, India, I'm told they're not as good and reliable as what we have here in the U.S. So, of course, there are some concerns on doing that. Um, here in the U.S., we have some of the different, you know, not, I know it's not as big as the Eastern Interconnect or the Western Interconnect or ERCOT, but we do have some of those different players where it sort of feeds into the grid across a bunch of different locations. And so there's a lot of folks at CMU, and I think here as well, that do study a lot of those transmission uh, costs and how to do some of those calculations appropriately. So I'd love to chat with you or others sometime more about research in those areas. Hi. Um do you ever worry about uh, sort of the timeline of the decision-making process um, outside, you know, this, this frame of work? Um, I worry that by the time it takes to, you know, get this data, do this analysis, and trying to put it in, into simpler words and making it into a decision-making point, uh, you know, India already produces uh, its electricity from 60% coal or something, and the plan is to double that production. So there's a lot going on even outside this frame of reference and do you, is that in any way you know factored into this sort of systems thinking yes so i think that there are two pieces there's the timelines that the decision makers have when they have an opportunity a window of opportunity and then there's a timeline that occurs otherwise when there's a window of opportunity we as researchers have to be ready to provide data of whatever sort that the policymakers might need I mean, folks might argue with me, like, there are some scientists that love to work on science just purely for the pure understanding. But I tend to come from the school of thought of, I'm an engineer, right? I, I want to have my work help people, right? And do something good for, for the different communities. So window of opportunity, a hurricane comes and hits, I got to be ready with that right away of, okay, well, here's a bunch of different options, you know, pick one moving forward. And likely they're not going to come to just me. They'll come to every single person in, in the city and go off and chat with folks in California and here at UT Austin and everywhere to get some of this information, right? And what this framework then does is, in that instance, allow all these different pieces that are coming together from different researchers to be compared quickly and easily. The second type is when there's no window of opportunity and you're just trying to figure out these things either for in preparation when a window of opportunity happens or, you know, on a normal policy timeline, which building certain things in the city of Pittsburgh, just even changing the tax codes to ask different commercial uh, buildings to alter their stormwater runoff has been taking four or five years. So within four or five years, um, knock on wood, our PhD students can come up with a really great product in that time period and have those information ready. So, Really, I think it's just a, a component of, you know, having that data sort of already being worked on, and then when the window of opportunity comes, having it right available there. Otherwise, yeah, they're just really slow in a lot of instances. And I don't even have to, you know, get started on how quickly the U.S. government has been moving on climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. So that's a different conversation. Right. Um, thanks for... Uh mentioning Texas several times to feed our egos. Now that we're down <laughs> there. So, um, uh, I may ask a similar question to the last one instead of time, but based on its spatial scale or scale of governance or something. So with your four S's uh, from source to suffering down at the bottom, uh, have you thought about or should we, a person, think about which type of entity, government-wise, since you're thinking, talking to your mayor, should be dealing more with one of these issues versus the other? Should the federal government be focused more on greenhouse and city governments be focused more on suffering, for example? Yeah, when we do these analyses and pick the region that we're looking at, the cities, of course, can do things that will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not going to be enough of a greenhouse gas reduction, even if we had you know, C40 or C100 come together. C40 is the biggest, the 40 biggest cities in the world, and C100 is the 100 biggest cities. Even if they were reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, it's not going to do a lot, right? Um, 
but we're seeing political willpower in some of the cities to do these sorts of things. And so they want to know, you know, how does this compare to other things that we can do? And what I've seen is that they tend to pull out things in these strategies five through eight, those metal adaptation strategies that also have greenhouse gas reductions as co-benefits, um, but they're not really seeing them as their main thing being greenhouse gas reductions. For instance, green infrastructure comes up a lot. Um, Pittsburgh also has a huge stormwater problem. So being able to deal with some of that runoff is very, very important to the city. And of course, then when you have the green infrastructure, it'll sequester some carbon, do some other evapotranspiration goodness and things to reduce heat. Um, the emergency management, the suffering at the end, does tend to seem to be focused in the city's emergency management department. But entertainingly or not, um, OK, please don't shoot me. Uh, Every single city I've worked with has problems in being siloed in that this Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and the Department of uh, Hazard Mitigation, they don't work together. They're all siloed in each other, and the point of connection is the mayor's office at the top. Right? Sadly, in the big cities I worked with, in Philadelphia, D.C., and Pittsburgh, but I'm also seeing it in New Jersey, um, Atlanta. Like, There's 10 or 11 different communities I'm working with now, every single one whether they're small or big, seems to be like this. And so what we're seeing is a good co-benefit of this decision tool is that these different groups are trying to realize that the things they do are actually really super connected to the things that the other guy's doing. And if they get together, then um, there's not enough money ever in city government. So group A gets together with group B and like, hey, you know, if we do this particular thing here, it's also going to help me down here. And then pooling our money together, we'll have enough money to actually do something as opposed to just you know, sit on our hands. And so that, I think, has been, truthfully, the most interesting political side effect of what I've been seeing is that when you start to use this sort of thing, people realize that they're actually connected and start to be more willing to work to each with each other. Whether this will last, who knows? But um, it's, it's a step in the right direction for a systems analysis thinker like myself. Oh, okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you thought a little bit, maybe not as much as you'd like, but still it's great to see your presentation. Um, so since up ramps are different than down ramps as far as photovoltaic or, or wind, you know, it'd be interesting to see your research about uh, safer utility scale solar, how the grid operator can actually curtail the output, which can further dampen the undulations there and the frequencies at the high end. Do you have any additional data about that asymmetry and how you can exploit that to further improve the so what so let me see if uh, was it okay so um, in this piece right here I think one of the things that we're starting to be unclear about is um, whether our India data are actually good enough on the one second resolution to be able to replicate that sort of down ramp. Um, physically, I could give a good reason for why that would occur, and it would be a 3D turbulence argument. Uh, but uh, it follows a F to the minus 3 spectrum, which that line is. But we're not seeing that in the plants in India, and it's unclear to me why. And because I can't answer that, um, I can't then answer your question, which is, you know, how are we going to do? some of these really super high frequency one second stuff, I'm like, because I'm not actually 100% sure that our spectrum are right on those pieces. We're trying to get a bunch of US data. When the non-disclosure agreement gets worked out, then we'll know. Maybe. Okay. 